Well, good morning again, and we are continuing this morning with our summer series, Summer in the Psalms. <clears throat> and we're going to be looking at a beautiful psalm this morning. We're looking at Psalm 139. And actually, we'll be looking at this psalm over the next couple weeks, this week and next week, just because there's, there's so much wonderful, wonderful theology in this psalm. But like the Psalms, the Psalms are poetic theology. The Psalms are practical theology. Often we, we study passages in the Bible and we read of just didactic truth. But here in the Psalms, we get the human condition. We get the emotions as the, the psalmist wrestle with the truths about God, about His Word, about their, their position on this earth. And, and they wrestle with these truths and we get the nature of the human condition. I always encourage People, when they ask me, oh, what, what should I read in my devotion time? I'm like, well, a good place to start is the Psalms. Right? If, you're, if you're down, the Psalms speak to when you're down. When you're in despair, depressed, the Psalms speak to that condition. When you're, when you're joyous, the Psalms speak to that condition. When you feel separated or far from God, the Psalms speak to that condition. Because you see the psalmists are applying the theology to their lives and we have these beautiful, beautiful psalms that are they are poetry, that are poetic and, and they, they give us beautiful imagery that we can latch on to. I would say, dare say that most of you in here have memorized or most of you try to memorize it. Psalm 23 and the, the beautiful poetry that is the picture of God as our shepherd and us as a sheep. And when we come to Psalm 139, we, we come to another psalm where it's not just dry theology. This isn't a seminary class where David is sitting us down and he's teaching us about the character and the, the nature of God. And, and we're discussing it as if it's, it's just theology apart from our own lives. David lays out Psalm 139 and, and he speaks about the character and the nature of God and, and he talks about it in terms of, of my and me and I. David has internalized the truth about God and, and he lives his life with a devotion to God based on what he knows to be true about God. And that's where we want to be. That's where we want to be as Christians. We want to not just hear the truth, but be doers of the truth. Not just know that God is omnipotent or omniscient or omnipotent or, or sovereign, but what does that mean in my life? That's the joy of the Psalms. That's the joy of Psalm 139. Because Psalm, in Psalm 139, David wants you to live a life of purpose. A life of, of ever-growing devotion to God because that's David's response to the character, to the nature of God, is greater devotion. Psalm 139, which we'll get to next week, at the very end, David, after all is said and done, he, he prays that God search me, try me, lead me. He wants to grow in his devotion to God. He wants to live a life of purpose. I picked up John Piper's book this week. It's a great book, Don't Waste Your Life. And I read through it before, just started rereading it, and just a reminder, and in God's providence, it's it so related to the things that I was studying in Psalm 139. And, and in this book, John Piper relates a story. And he relates a story about a couple in the U.S. They, they retired early in their 50s. And they, they moved to Florida. And they spent all their time enjoying God's creation, traveling around and, and looking at just the wonderful beaches. And, and Piper makes this statement. He said, picture this in your mind. When they stand before Christ and he says, what did you do? with the life that I gave you? What did you do with the, the time I gave you? And he says, what are they going to say? Look, Lord, here are my seashells. Piper makes the point, what a tragedy. What a waste of time. Brethren, God has given you your life. He's given you the time that you have for purpose. 
Now the world says that our only purpose in this life is to eat, to drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Enjoy life. Suck the morrow out of life. That's the purpose that the world has. Follow your heart. Follow your dreams. Try to be happy. You want to be fulfilled life? Be a, be a happy person. Find things that make you happy. And if, and if you're not happy, then you need to do whatever it takes to be happy. Yet the reality, the reality, the truth, as God sees it, the reality is that apart from God, there is no purpose in life. There is no meaning. There's hopelessness. There's despair. There's judgment. There's death. The world we live in, in its pursuit of happiness above all else, happiness as, as its God, has produced a world where there, there's, there's people, more people than ever before on psychotropic drugs, people struggling with depression and other issues. Because in their pursuit of happiness, they find that those things don't make them happy. And if they don't make their happy, and they've been told they do make them happy, then, then there must be something wrong. The truth. They don't have the truth to be able to understand and comprehend the world they live in. We all know what Solomon says, right? Solomon says, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Solomon did it all, right? He's part of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll crowd. He did it all. He built monuments. He read books. He had many wives. Engaged in pleasures of, of anything and everything he could think of. And in the end, he said, it is worthless. It is like a puff of cloud, a wisp of smoke. It is vanity. That's a life lived apart from God. You see, mankind has a life, a wasted life. But as Christians, we are different. As believers, we are different. We, we have a purpose, our purpose. And the Westminster Catechism sums it up very succinctly that, that what is the chief end of man, the chief purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. It's our purpose. <coughs> Brethren, we, we have a purpose. And even for us, the challenge is, are we living to that purpose or are we wasting our lives? Are we wasting the time? We can't get it back. Once it's spent. We see this see it's in our kids. My wife and I are looking at pictures. We've been here in Australia in this church almost five years, coming up five years in March, and we were looking at pictures. Saw a picture and it had had uh, little Rian and little Morty. Right? In we were at uh, I believe we were at uh, Gratz's pool party. It was when our first month here and some of the little kids and you know the parents are holding these little kids and we're kind of laughing and our kids are there and. You, know, you see the kids grow up. We can't go back. Can't go back. Can't go back to my daughter's three. Can't go back to when my son was five. Time marches on. Time marches on for all of us. So one, in Psalm 139, David calls all those that would hear him to live a life of purpose. Live a life of ever-growing devotion and dedication to the Lord. And he lays out... This And he lays out this in a way that's very interesting. He lays out his call in his own life. Lord, search me, lead me, guide me, so that I may grow in my understanding of you and I may walk in the way of eternal life. But he lays this out by, by giving us and giving anyone who would read him a greater understanding of the nature and the character of God. You see, David, like I said before, he, he didn't write this as an academic so that you would just learn and grow in your knowledge. He wants you to interact with the truth, just like he interacted with the truth. What we believe about God does affect how we live. You look at David's greatest failures as when he forgot the truth that he expounded in Psalm 139. We don't know when he wrote Psalm 139, what part of his life. But his greatest fear is he forgot that God knows him, was God was with him, and God is sovereign over his life. He forgot those fundamental truths. What we know about God does affect how we live.
our lives. What we know about God does give our lives meaning and purpose. Brethren, we're all guilty of getting caught up in the trivial things of life. Right? The things that we want to make ourselves happy with. We get caught up with the things of this world. I'm not saying the things of this world aren't nice. God is kind. God is generous and He gives us good things to enjoy. But we get caught up in these trivial things and they make it, we make them our pursuits. They become idols to us. And we devote time and energy, money, finances, everything towards these things at the expense of everything else. We, as Christians, we get caught up in these things and our prayer life falters. Our devotion falters. Our repentance for sin falters. So the question is, do you find joy? Do you find joy in God alone? Do you find joy in His people? Do you find joy in His Word? Do you seek to glorify Him in everything you do as the purpose of your life? As the driving force of your life, are you living a life of purpose or a wasted life? Do you love being around His people? Do you love being around God? Is His Word a delight? Well, David challenges all those who would hear him this morning in Psalm 139 to grow, to live a life of devotion to the Lord, to to grow in their understanding of who God is and as a result be motivated to devote themselves more fully to God and a walk with Him. And so in this psalm, we're going to look at four truths. Four truths, two this week, two next week. The four truths are very simple, really. Very simple. God is all-knowing. God is always present. God is in control. And God judges righteously. Four truths. God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. God is always present. God is omnipresent. God is in control. God is sovereign. And God judges righteously. God is just. Lays out the character and attributes and nature of God. Let's look at this text together. Psalm 139. For a choir director, a psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down, and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before, and you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I can't attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take to the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand would lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. For you form my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast the sum of them! If I could count them, they would number the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed. For the wicked speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate 
those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with an uttermost hatred, and they have become my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. So the first truth that David expounds this morning is that God is all-knowing. And you see this in this psalm. It's, It's a beautiful, poetic psalm that has four sections or four stanzas of six verses each. They break up beautifully. And the first stanza, verses 1 through 6, is David lays out the fact that that God is all-knowing. And he begins begins by saying, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You search me and you know me. And he begins, and David is, is, is saying this in an intimate way. He begins even with, O Lord, O Yahweh. This is the, the covenant name of God. David is a believer, right? He's a believer in God. He's in a covenant relationship with God. And he starts out and he says, Lord, you know me. You, you searched me. By the way, the word search there is, is a term used that, that miners would use. They would dig into the ground and they're, they're digging in there carefully searching for gold or jewels, precious stones. And he says, you've searched me and you have known me. It's a, in other words, he's using these two terms together to picture a thorough knowledge of God. God, you know me. You know me. We just say that and we read that and we don't think about how powerful that is. The Greek gods, the Roman gods, the Babylonian gods, the Persian gods, those gods didn't care less or couldn't care less about people. You read the stories of the Greek gods and the Roman gods and the Persian gods and the Babylonian gods and the Philistine gods. You read these stories and and these were gods that were angry They were vengeful, they were lustful, they were capricious. They couldn't be depended on. You had to appease their wrath if things were going wrong in your life. Or you had to convince them through sacrifices or offering or vows to do something for you, to show you favor. So when David says, God, you know me, that's an amazing statement. It's an amazing statement. You tell a pagan who worships a false god that the god of the universe who created all people, who right now there's 8 billion people on this earth and God knows each one of them and He knows you intimately, thoroughly. It's a powerful statement. David says, you know me intimately. And then David continues after making that bold statement in verse 1. He gives five ways that God knows you. Five ways. He says, first of all, in verse 2, You know me when I sit down and when I rise up. You know me when I sit down and when I rise up. Now, this is a merism. I know it's a wonderful, Greek, a wonderful Hebrew term, poetic term. You love it. A merism. And all it does, it just basically means that there are two ideas and they, they express, or two words and they express a unified idea. Right. What is David saying? David's saying that you know every movement I make. God knows when you get home from church and you sit down on that chair. Right? He knows when you get up from that chair. He knows every movement you make. God, David says, you know when I sit down, you know when I rise up. He knows every move you make, every breath you take, every step you make. Right? He knows you. Let's see if you get that. He knows your movements. He knows you that well. He sees you. He knows you. And David continues, he says, You understand my thoughts from afar. You understand my thoughts. Now, the thoughts are the, the intentions, the motivations, the striving. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God can know it. You realize we don't, often we don't even know our motivations. We don't understand fully why we do what we do. Because our sinful heart is screaming to be appeased. 
the flesh screams. As one of my, my mentors used to say, he said, when you're counseling people, you need to remember that the flesh screams. It wants what it wants. The heart is wicked and deceitful. We're, we're deceived. We think we have pure motives and motivation. The reality is we just want to indulge in the flesh. But David says, look, you understand. And by the way, the understand there carries the idea of evaluation. That God doesn't just know, but He's evaluating our thoughts. Right? He's looking at our thoughts. God knows not only the reasons, sorry, God, God knows our movements, but He knows why we do what we do. That's thorough knowledge. And He says He knows from afar. Now, it's interesting, and the real reason I bring this up is because the, the Hebrew word is interesting because it can give the idea of either space, of distance, and the most time we would take this as distance because it kind of reads that way in the English, that God is in heaven, and even though He's in heaven and He seems to be distant from us, He is imminent and He does know every thought that we're making. But it also carries the idea of time as well. Time means nothing to God. I was talking to my son about this last night and, I, I, and he, was, he, was, he was saying, well, what do you mean? I was, so I was trying to coin a term and I said, He's extra-temporal. So you can use that, I made that up. Extra-temporal. He's outside of time and space. That's how God can choose us before the foundation of the world and the Old Testament saints can believe in Him and the blood of Jesus Christ could be applied to them even though it hadn't yet happened because He's extra-temporal. He knows your thoughts. He knows your motivations from afar. David says, number three, in verse three, you scrutinize my path and my laying down. This is a, a very simple, some another merism, a very simple way of saying God knows your routine. He knows what time you go to bed. He knows what time you get up and you go down to work. This is the idea of the path, the, the, the place that you walk, the place, the path that you walk on, where you go, when you lie down, the sleep you take. And it's interesting because he says you scrutinize. Remember, understand is that we earlier I said understand kind of the idea of evaluate. Scrutinize, the word scrutinize is to winnow. Right? You winnow. You, you, you remove what wheat from chaff. That's winnowing. So he's looking at your path. He's looking at your daily routine. And he's evaluating what you are doing in your life to see whether it is worthless or it is truly worthwhile. God brings what is hidden in darkness to light. So this is the all-encompassing knowledge of God. He knows you intimately, thoroughly. He knows when you, when, when you sit. He knows your movements. He knows your thoughts and your motivations. He knows your movements. He knows your, your daily routine. He knows everything about you. And He's evaluating your life. Number four... Well, number three, I continue. David says he knows your path. He's intimately acquainted with your ways. He's intimately acquainted. He knows you thoroughly. He's intimately. By the way, he, he's intimately acquainted with you. He knows you better than anybody else. For those of you that have been married, 41 years. Those of you who have been married a long time, uh, approaching, I'm like 22 and a half myself. I know my wife. But there are things, it's amazing. Every now and then I run across something, oh, I didn't know that. I've never, I've never heard that story. You never told me that. I'm learning things all the time. And I, I intimately know my wife, but yet God knows you that much more. There's no one on this earth that knows you more intimately than God Himself. He knows your thoughts, your motivations, your hopes. He knows your past. He knows everything. People's understanding of you is finite, but God's understanding is infinite, even down to the minute detail. That minutest detail. But number four, David says in verse four, even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. God knows what you're going to say. God knows what you're going to say before you say it. This is the all-encompassing knowledge of God. And by the way, it doesn't, know, it doesn't matter what language you speak. That thought alone blows my mind. 
So I was meditating on this. Jimmy can go to India and worship with believers in India and they're praising God in a language, not English, and God knows exactly what they are saying and what they mean. You can come to Australia and get Australian English and... Just kidding. <laughs> and David, David is overwhelmed, right? Whenever you see the word behold, you need to go, behold. You need to pause. It's like the word therefore. You ever see the word therefore in Scripture? You need to ask, why is the therefore therefore, right? When you see behold, you need to go, well, behold. Where I'm from, we would say, golly. You need to stop. Because David is overwhelmed. He, he's, he's, behold, what? Oh Lord, you, you know it all. He's, this is his meditations. He's meditating on the, the character and nature of God that, that, that God knows it all. He says later on in Psalm 139, he says, oh, when I awake, you're still there. In other words, when he, when he comes to his senses from this meditation, he goes, Lord, you're still there. He's, he's meditating on this truth. And he says in his mind, he's like, wow, you know it all, Lord. You know my thoughts, my actions, my speech, my movements. And then he continues. He's not done. He says, God, you, you know what I need. In verse 5, he says, you have enclosed me behind and before, and you laid your hand upon me. The word enclosed there carries the idea of being surrounded on all sides. You're surrounded on all sides by the knowledge of God. You can't take a breath without Him knowing it. You don't have a thought without Him knowing it. You can't say a word without Him knowing it. You can't take a step without Him knowing it. You are enclosed on all sides. From behind and before. You can't make a move. Your hand is upon me. The word there for hand is not the usual word for hand of God when you read often in the Psalms. And we'll actually get this word a little bit later. But, but the word for hand is usually God's power. The hand of God. This has a, carries a different connotation, a different Hebrew word. It's the, the, the palm of God. It has the idea of, 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 a cup, of cupping something. For example, the other night, we're sitting in our room and a, and a grasshopper flew on the screen, right? My daughter loves, bird, loves insects, she loves animals. So what did I do? I naturally went outside, and I, what did I do? I, I cupped the grasshopper and got him in my hand. And, and I could feel, every time, every move that grasshopper made, I could feel it, right? Trying to get away. And I, and I, and I cupped it, and I showed my, my children, and they were amazed, and we looked at it, and, and then I put it in a jar and let it bounce around for a minute or two, and we, we took it out and let it go. But that's the picture here, that, that God, God is cupping you. And so what this is, is that God's knowledge is, is a hedge of protection. It's a wonderful thought that, that no matter what circumstances you're in, God knows it. That God knows you. And so when I said God knows what you need, I said God is protecting us. He's guiding us. Another way to look at this is, is God's cupping us in His hand. What do you do with a little child who's walking along? He places, or she places their little hand in yours. And you guide them along. And you lead them along. Right? God is leading you. He's guiding you. He knows you. His knowledge, his knowledge surrounds you. Brethren, our greatest need, and David even knows this and he says this at the end of the psalm, the greatest need is that we would be sanctified, that we would be more like God, more holy, that we would devote ourselves more fully to Him. And here's His knowledge encircling us guiding us. You may say, well, well Pastor, what, what about, what if we go into a situation and God knows all things and He's guiding us, He leads us, he, he leads us into a situation where we die. Well, then it's our time. This psalm, as we're going to speak about next week, God ordains every day you live. He, he's ordained your birth, He's ordained your life, He's ordained your death. And if He leads you into a situation where you die, then you, you, you die for His glory. As a believer, 
Because you've lived a life of purpose, of meaning. So David is, he's given five reasons. Five ways, excuse me. Five ways that God is all-knowing. And then David responds. I love verse 6, because you're probably thinking this in your head already, right? You're thinking these, these thoughts that David is thinking in verse 6. He says, such knowledge, this is too wonderful. It's too wonderful for me. It's too high. I can't attain it. Right? The word wonder, wonderful there, it, it literally means incomprehensible, extraordinary, awesome. Right? Not in a surfer sense. That's awesome, dude. This is, this is awe-inspiring. This is wonderful. This is incomprehensible. David is thinking of, of just the fact that God knows everything and he can't make a move. He can't think a thought. He can't say a word without God knowing it. And he's overwhelmed. He says, God, you're too wonderful. This is extraordinary. It's supernatural. It's incomprehensible. The word there, wonderful, by the way, is used in the Old Testament for, mer- for the miraculous, the wonderful, the extraordinary, the, the spectacular works of God. This is it's completely above David's ability to comprehend. As finite creatures, if we could understand an infinite God, He would not be God. This knowledge. The, and, and then he makes it really, and I think David is also thinking about the fact that the God who knows 8 billion, let's say 8 billion people, 8 billion, billion people on this earth, and he knows each one of those people by name, because he created them, the God of the universe knows you intimately. That's what David's saying. It's too wonderful for me to even think about that God of all of creation knows me and knows me better than I know myself. And not only does he he know me, as David actually says later on in Psalm 139, his intentions are good towards me and loving towards me. David says it's too high. The knowledge of God is too high. It's like an unattainable fortress. I can't attain it. I I can't conquer it. I can't prevail it. I can't can't overcome it. I can't understand it. I'm powerless to resist the knowledge of God. Brother, I ran across an article this week as I was just thinking about the knowledge of God. And I ran ran across an article. I encourage you guys to read it. But it's about how Google, the great links that Google and Facebook, but especially Google, is going to collect your data. And the, the digital profile that they have on each one of you is amazing. Right? A few of the highlights, and there's so much, I, I could spend a long time with this, I'm not. But a few of the highlights, Google knows your location. And they know your location ever since you turned on your phone, if your phone location tracker is on, especially if you have an Android. Or if you use Google Maps, in, its, in, in the entirety of your life, They have a record of every time you use Google Maps. They've recorded everything you've searched on Google in your life. They know what apps you use on your phone. They know your YouTube history, because Google owns YouTube, what you've searched. They know your calendar of events, if you have Google Calendar. They know information that you've deleted if you've used Google Drive. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's nothing. That's nothing compared to what God knows about you. God knows every detail. Every hidden fact, every hidden sin, every besetting sin, every rebellious thought, every hope, every dream, every word, every movement, every thought that you have, God knows. Google can only know your actions, but God knows your thoughts. You see, there's really two ways to process this great truth. There's two ways to process this truth. One, you can look at this reality that God hems you in. That God knows everything about you. And you can look at this reality as terrifying. God is terrifying. He knows my thoughts, my speech, my actions. He knows my, where I go during the week. He knows how you like to cover up your past. 
He knows how you like to exaggerate your achievements, your education, your ability. He knows you as you really are. Brethren, that's you this morning. If you're, if you're living a life where there's hypocrisy in your life and, and you think that, that no one can know and, and I can live my life and I can come to church and I can play the part and I can, I can, I can look like a, a good Christian, I can be almost a Judas, but in reality my heart is wicked and, and I just desire the things of the world, the, the call for you, if you find this terrifying, is repent. Repent of your sins. Ask God to cleanse you of unrighteousness. And devote yourself to the Lord even more fully. The other way to look at it is just what an awesome privilege. What an awesome privilege that, that God created billions and He knows you intimately. And as David says later on in Psalm 139, that, that His thoughts and intentions are only good to you. What a privilege it is. He loves you. He has chosen you before the foundation of the world in Christ that you would be born again, that you would be His child for eternity. I love Jesus' words in John 10. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. I know my own. I know my own. And my own know me. Jesus knows His own. Ephesians 1.5, in love, in love He predestined us to adoption as Son through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. According to God's kindness and His love for you, He has chosen you and He's predestined that you would come to faith in Jesus Christ. Brother David's not discussing omniscience in a seminary class. This is the FOF where we discuss the theology of who God is. This is not a philosophical discussion. This is a personal discussion where David is overwhelmed by the magnificence of his Creator. And he wants you to be overwhelmed. He wants you to be so overwhelmed that as you get to Psalm, into Psalm 139, you say what David says. You say, Lord, search my heart. Try me, Lord. Lead me, God. That's what he wants. David wants us to live a life not of waste, but of purpose. I want you to live a life honoring the Lord. I want you to live a life where you're praying that prayer, where you're asking God, search my heart, show me the things in my life that are unacceptable because I know that you know me better than I know myself. Search me, O Lord. Try me. Test me. Test me. Put me through test and trial so that my faith will grow, that my commitment, my loyalty to you will be demonstrated over and over and over. That's what he's saying at the end of Psalm 139. And then he says, lead me. Lead me in the everlasting way. What's the everlasting way? It's the way of righteousness, the way of honoring God. It's, a, it's a obedient to, to God, a life, excuse me, a life that's lived in obedience to His words. The everlasting way, an eternal life. Lead me into to a, a greater devotion to you, a greater obedience to you. Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commandments. In a greater, greater devotion to God, God leads to a greater, what? Obedience to Him. We obey not because we have to, we're forced to, like we have to force our kids to obey sometimes. Right? God doesn't want us to be, feel like we're forced to. He wants us to, uh, him, wants us to obey Him because we know Him and He knows us and He loves us and we love Him. God is all-knowing. God's also all present. So the second truth is God is always present. David says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Notice there's that echo here in verse 7. Where? Where? Where can I go? You hear it? The silence is deafening. Right? Where can we go from God? Where can I flee? It's human nature to flee. 
human nature is to, to resist God. Human nature is to, is to not want to be a part of what God has for you, to, to resist His authority. Jesus says this Himself in, in John chapter 3. He says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. If you don't come into the light, what are you doing from the light? You're running, you're fleeing from the light. That's the natural state of men. You guys, you guys know Jonah? Jonah's a great example of this. God says, hey, go to Nineveh. Jonah says, yeah, no. Nah. Gets on a boat and goes in the opposite direction. And what, is, what does Jonah find? Jonah finds out the truth that we just learned, that God knows everything. And as we're getting ready to see even in greater detail, that God is everywhere. Right? God's on that boat with him. You can sail by the storm. God's in that fish with him because God answers his prayer. See, we can't flee, we can't run from God. But David means this in a, in a rhetorical sense. He says, where can I go? Where? Where? And, and he wants us to say, nowhere. And once again, he gives us five, five places to consider. And notice there's ifs. Verse 8, there's if, if. In verse 9, there's if, if. And even over in verse 11, if. Right? He just gives five ifs, five conditional clauses here. Like, if I could go anywhere, he said, if I could ascend to heaven. It's kind of a funny one, right? If I could go to heaven, you'll be there. I, I love what Spurgeon said. I was reading in his uh, commentary on Psalms. He, says, he said, it's like flying into the center of the fire to escape the heat. If, if I, it's ridiculous. So, so David starts out with a ridiculous. If I could go to heaven, oh wait, you're there. Then he says, if I go to make my bed in Sheol, you're there. And notice he says, behold, because that's a thought that calls David to pause. Wait a second. Sheol is the abode of the dead. Hades, Gehenna, hell. It's a place where, it's a place where people go when they die. And it's a, it is a place of darkness, of torment, of gnashing of teeth, where the worm does not die and the thirst does not quench. It's a place of, of torment where, where unbelievers go until they're judged at the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20 and going into eternal hell, which is the lake of fire. So he's saying that, Lord, even if I was to go to hell, you're there. That's, now God's presence is there. There's no, there's no blessing of God there. There's no kindness of God there. There's only His judgment. But God is there. And David does, and once again, if you see the behold, behold, he, he, he's, he stops and he goes, wait, yeah, you're there. You'd be there because you're everywhere. He says, if I ascend to heaven, number one, if I go to Sheol, you're there. By the way, when it comes to Sheol, there's, there's no purgatory. I just want to make sure we're clear. Sheol is the boat of the dead. There's no purgatory. There's no need to pray for the dead. I, went to a, I even went to a Protestant funeral one time where I heard the, the, the guy who was doing the ceremony, the officiant, he actually prayed for the dead person. Like, don't pray for the dead. Pray for those who are living. Right? It's too late. It's appointed, to, appointed for a man to, to die once and face judgment. Hebrews chapter 9. There's no purgatory. But God is present. And then not only does he say, if I go to heaven, I go to hell. He says, verse 9, if I take the wings of the dawn. Right? This is poetic. It's a beautiful picture of sunrise. I remember hiking at Philmont Scout Range, and I remember us being in this dark valley, and we got, we got up early because it, it's kind of like here in the summer. It gets really hot in the daytime, and so you get up early, and you can hike, and you can get hours of hiking in before it gets really hot. And, and we're in this valley, and it's cold, and we're all bundled up. And, and I remember even though it was light outside, the, the sun hadn't yet hit this valley. And I remember about 10 o'clock, the sun came above the mountain, and when all of a sudden it was like, boom! What was darkness is now light. And that's what David's saying. If I could fly to the, if I could fly from the east to the west, if I could, if I could fly faster than light, you would be there. If I could fly like the sun and the speed of the dawn, you would be there. And he says, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, 
And he's not talking about, he's not talking about depth of the sea, right? Because he's already, he's already went up and down, right? David, David's doing the compass. He said, if I go up, if I go down, if I go sunrise, if I, now he's talking about going west. So from Jerusalem, if David got in the boat and he traveled across the Mediterranean, and he traveled across to the end of the Mediterranean Sea, past Gibraltar, he cra- passed over the Atlantic Ocean, he went through the Panama Canal, passed over the Pacific Ocean, and he came to this great unknown island called Terra Australis. God would still be there. Praise God. If I, remotest, if I could go to the remotest island of the sea, if you were cast away on a deserted island, God would be there. And David says, in fact, in that comment alone calls David to pause and he says, even there your hand will be with me. Your right hand will lay hold of me. He says, even if I could go to farthest west that I could possibly go. Now think about it in David's mind. I'm going away from the tabernacle. I'm going away from the priesthood. I'm going away from the people of God. I'm going away from the promised land. Even if I could go to Terra Australis, Australia, way across the globe, you would be there and your hand would still guide me and lead me. It's the same word for leading and guiding used in Psalm 23. David's still thinking about him as a sheep. God, you will lead me and guide me no matter where I go. And he said, your, your hand will lay hold of me. The idea there is, 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 this is, the, this is by the way, this is God's hand of power. It's not his palm. This hand of power, your hand is there. Your, your powerful hand is holding me firmly securing me with loving intentions. God is everywhere. He secures me. Right? And He does it in love. And then in verse 11, David says, if, once again, this is the final one, verse 5, right? If, the final place to consider, if the, what? If the darkness overwhelms me and the light will be as night. One of the things you have to think about, they didn't have electricity. When it got dark on a moonless night or a cloudy night, they would have lanterns, candles. If you want to think about how this this would be, go camping. Go camping or go out in a yard if there's no street lights around. Right? On On a moonless night, take a candle and just see what you can see. Blow that candle out and you see how dark it actually would be. David says, if I was in utter darkness, right? if I was in a place where I was overwhelmed and darkness surrounded me and it was, it was utterly incapable of seeing, what does he say? It doesn't matter. Verse 12, the darkness isn't dark to you. Just remember, God doesn't need light to see. God created light. God's presence is there. What a blessing, brethren, it is for us to consider the unchanging nature of God. Right? He said God is there. God is everywhere. Darkness is like light to you. It doesn't matter. I can't go anywhere. I can, go, I can try any of these places and you are there, O oh Lord. And now remember, David doesn't have the full revelation of Jesus Christ that we do. He doesn't have the promise of John 14 that when Jesus departs that the Holy Spirit would come and indwell us forever. So not only is God everywhere, but He is in us. He's Emmanuel, God with us. God in us. That's a blessing we have this side of the cross. Brethren, don't don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. God is omnipotent. Sorry, God is omniscient in that He knows all things. He's all knowing. He knows you. You can't take a a breath without Him knowing it. But God is everywhere. You can't escape Him if you wanted to. And when we forget these truths, we forget that God knows everything, that God is everywhere, that, that leads us, what? Into sin. We forget the character and nature of God and we think that God doesn't see or God doesn't hear or God's not really here with me as I'm doing this act of sin. God calls us to be holy, to live a life devoted to Him. And we should want to. Just for the fact that 
He knows everything and He has loving intentions to us. He's everywhere and He, and he, he, and he, and he holds us secure in His hand. We glorify God and we enjoy Him forever. And the great thing is nothing can separate us from the penetrating knowledge and the powerful presence of God Almighty. Romans chapter 8. Nothing can take us out of God's hand. Your hand will lead me. Your hand will lay hold of me. Your hand will guide me. Paul says in Romans 8 that nothing can take us out of God's hand. He knows us. He knows us well. You can trust Him. He's everywhere. He surrounds you. He loves you. He has good intentions for you. And He desires that you would walk with Him, that you would live a life of purpose. We'll see more of this next week as we continue our study in Psalm 139. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for the truth of Your Word that, Lord, we, Lord, we echo the thoughts of David Lord, how wonderful is this to us? How far above us to to think that you know us so well, that you know all things. And yet, you love us before we loved you. Lord, how wonderful it is to think about the fact that you were everywhere. Even if we wanted to escape you, we could not. But Lord, for us that know you as Lord and Savior, this is not a terrifying proposition, but a comforting one. That no matter what we're going through in life, what circumstances that we are going through in life, you are there. You're not ignorant, you're not surprised, and you love us and you care about us. Father, I pray that, Lord, we would live lives of purpose, that we would not waste our life, that that we would remember these truths and that we would dwell on them, that we would not forget your character and nature, but instead meditate on these things. Lord, may we live lives honoring to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ.